Welcome, ladies, to another edition of the Feel Amazing Naked podcast. And today we're talking about sex and intimacy, which is one of my favorite topics. And based on downloads, it's one of your favorite topics, too. So today I have on the show Alexander Stockwell, who is a relationship and intimacy expert. And I'm very excited to dive into today's content. So welcome to the show. Thank you. I love that we're going to be doing this together. Absolutely. So we met um, in New York City uh, back in October of 2019, where you and I were both attending a media event where we got to kind of, I would say, showcase what the things that are happening in our businesses. And right away, we were kind of, I was up in front of the group of women, kind of pitching my ideas surrounding my branding, Feel Amazing Naked. And you gave me some feedback that really kind of hit me. And later on in the evening, I had the chance to sit with you and just said, I would really love to talk more about um, intimacy and sex on my show because the women listening love that content. Um, so here we are today. But I think what's really intriguing too, the more I got to learn about you looking at your bio is you were a physician and through a journey, which you're going to share in just a moment, became this relationship and intimacy expert. And I'm speculating a lot because of your own experiences in that practice and in your um, relationships too. So maybe you could start by sharing a little bit more about how that journey look, what it looked like and how it led you to what you do now. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And honestly, I answer that question in different ways, depending on the context, but I'm going to, in this context with Feel Amazing Naked, really share how I talked with myself about it, because there's a lot of external context, but the important internal thing is that I was super driven, ambitious, highly competent, and I had really achieved everything that I had been working towards for two decades. I was a practicing physician. I had my own practice. I paid off my medical school loans. I was married. And at that point, I had three of my four children. And I thought I should feel fantastic. I should feel really satisfied. I had set things up and achieved this incredible dream. But in fact, inside, I had this like, low volume dissatisfaction. And the more I looked at it, I realized that I was prioritizing my patients over my family and my family over myself. And I really, time management is not my challenge. I know how to do a lot of things, but I somehow couldn't get that right. And I'm choosing to share this because I think this is totally related to the underbelly of Feel Amazing Naked. I tried a lot of different things. I tried different time management tools. I, during, I just tried a lot of different things. And in the end, I was clear that I didn't know how to do it. I couldn't figure it out. And there were no negative consequences yet. If I continued in this manner for another 40 years, I would end up depleted and resentful. And I will add the other piece, which is that around this time, my oldest child, Josephine, turned nine. And she was this, well, she still is this radiant, beautiful, expressive, creative, feminine creature. And I looked at her and her thought, she's taking such, she's so attuned to herself. And I definitely wasn't when I was nine years old. And I felt proud to have nurtured that in her. But there was no way she could live at home another nine years and continue to be so radiant and tuned in with herself if I was going to continue living this way, prioritizing my patients over my family, my family over myself, and slowly depleted and more resentful. I took a sabbatical from medicine. I I went cold turkey. I mean, I didn't really go cold turkey. I made the decision in a way that felt cold turkey, but I took a few months and slowly dialed down my practice and referred people to other doctors. And officially I took a sabbatical, but I intuitively knew I wasn't going to go back. And And the most hysterical thing happened. It was devastating at the time, but in hindsight, it's really quite funny because about three months after I went on sabbatical, I found myself volunteering at my children's school overseeing this massive project with 10 other people and creating this document that was 40 pages long and on the phone all the time and 
I basically had recreated the same situation, prioritizing something over my family, over myself. And this time it was volunteer. Mm -hmm. And that really confirmed my decision, even though at the time it didn't feel good. Yeah. I mean, so much just in this little (laughs) few minutes already diving in, but I, I relate to what you're saying in that, you know, for me, part of my journey was putting all of my energy into seeking fulfillment through body composition changes. And like, well, if I just get this super shredded, perfect body, I'll just be so happy. And I see that in my work with clients today. In fact, earlier this morning, I was speaking with a potential client and we talked a lot about uh, fulfillment you know, this notion that she couldn't love the body she was in right where it was right now. There was only this future self where she could love her body. And so I think that's, it's, it's work too. I, and I'm, I have to watch that temperature gauge, like you said, about not becoming nur- nurturing my work so much. If I just get there, it'll be better. If I just go this, you know, make this much money, have this m- many clients. So I think the women listening can relate on some level to what you're saying, whether it's being the best class mom, running a PTSA, it's if I just do this thing, I'll be happier. Yes. And the thing is always nurturing something else besides my relationship with myself, my capacity to honor myself and enjoy who I am. And in fact, when I started my sabbatical, I ended up doing a lot of different things, some that were like just working with a coach and taking different trainings, some that were a little kind of far out spiritual trainings or other kinds of trainings. But the first thing that I did was I went to the School of Womanly Arts and Actually, it wasn't chronologically the first thing, but it was the first thing that really made a difference, which was that I started, I learned how to enjoy myself as a woman because that was essential for me to feel fulfilled from the inside out and be able to have so much more to offer people. And I think it's spot on. Again, it's funny how we have this conversation and it's like little nuggets that I've been having or having with other women have come up, but um I tend to work with women that are highly ambitious and so much of that is masculine, right? We've been driven by mas- masculine thinking, masculine influence our whole life. So then when they work with me, I'm asking them to connect to some of that feminine energy that they've been resistant to. They don't even recognize it as masculine and feminine, really. It's just do, 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 hustle, hustle, hustle. And now I'm saying, slow down, connect. Like, what's your body telling you? And that's a very hard um, corner to turn for a lot of women. It is so hard. I myself shy away from calling it masculine versus feminine. I think it's for a few different reasons one of which is that I work with couples. I mean, I also work with individual women, but I work enough with couples that I don't want to talk about the masculine in that way. But even apart from that, there is a lot that is often considered masculine, which is fundamentally feminine, which is around consistency, like the seasons and the tides and Mm -hmm. the moon cycles. Like there's a lot I I tend to shy away from that language because people tend to think that feminine is somehow flighty and whimsical, which I'm not saying you said that, but I just really want to presence that, that the feminine also includes a steadiness and a presence. And so I really like to talk about the same thing that you're saying as the shift from doing mode to being mode. Oh, I love that. Society rewards us so much for doing, 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 being busy is like a a badge of um, excellence in our culture or, you know, how quickly a woman after having a C-section can be out driving and we all just think, oh, that's so amazing. But that's not how it lives in me anymore. I think what's so much more amazing is the capacity to sit and enjoy the sunset. Mm -hmm. That requires so much more of the ambitious, competent woman than pushing yourself after a long day at work or a surgery or any kind of thing like that. And actually, I recently gave a talk um, to mothers of 
children five and under called Connecting with Your Partner While Mothering Young Children. And in preparing for it, I realized how even from childhood, we are rewarded for doing, like when we learn to walk, our parents clap. It's just so exciting. Take that first step, go forward or finish that project and do all your homework. Like that's what we're rewarded for. And in our first years, like when a child just like sits peacefully and watches the cars go by, you don't get a lot of attention and reward for that. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. It's really an uphill battle, which I know you very elegantly fight. Yeah. Well, and so my daughter is 10 and my son is eight. And as you were talking, this is, that's the exact story that was playing out in my head is a discussion we had last week. My son was preparing for a spelling test and a vocabulary test actually. So I love vocabulary tests because it gives context and we can talk about meaning. Um, and so we were preparing and some of the words had, you know, multiple, um, applications. And so he came home and he said, you know, I did really well. And I said, well, I'm proud of you. And he said, well, I wanted to make sure I didn't clip down. So are you familiar with the clip up and down system? No, I'm ever not. Board? So it's essentially um, the kids start, I want to say in the yellow zone or something. And if there's a reward of behavior or outcome, they can clip up to these cooler colors like purple and pink. And if there's the opposite, you clip down to um, hotter colors, orange and red, right? And and I said, clip down. You mean if you didn't do well on a quiz that you studied and prepared for, you would have to be penalized and clip down? He said, like, yeah, I don't want to have to clip down. And I said, listen, I want you to focus on understanding. My goal is for you to be able to use those words and understand those when you read a book and when you're having conversations with people. And sometimes that doesn't always transition to getting a 70% on a test. And as I'm watching my children's life play out, I am just seeing exactly what you just said, that there's so much reward in doing and trying to help our kids and trying to figure out is, is this school system a place where we love having them? Or sometimes I feel like I'm having to undo what was done at school as far as that traditional path. So I think it is ingrained from such a young age is my point. So I, I totally- Yeah, that's right. And I mean, can you imagine if, um, listening attentively and deeply got a lot of attention in the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's like the teachers appreciate it, but that's not what gets, gets their attention. It's very true. So it really means that for most people, we arrive at adulthood with this learning yet to be mastered. So that transitions then into the other part of adulthood is marriage at some point or having a significant other in our lives. So I'm curious then you go through, you take this sabbatical and now your area of expertise and passion in life is helping um, men and women bring back or bring in general pleasure back into their relationships. Um, so tell me what does that look like in your life right now? You run a practice, you're seeing mostly couples as, as you said. So how did this kind of journey unfold to what it is today? Well, I realized that we have a profound lack of role models for long-term passionate partnerships. There's all kinds of examples from movies and people we know and all kinds of different contexts where the beginning of the relationship is very exciting. We, we have some image of what that looks like when it goes really well. And we really don't. And as mammals, we learn through imitation. So one of my missions is to share with as many people as possible what it looks like to have a really fantastic relationship. So let me say how I got there. One of the things that I did on my journey, I never would have expected it. Like I did not grow up sensually or sexually out there at all. In fact, the first conversation I ever had with my mother about sex was after I'd already had two children. So this was not <laughs> something that like, oh yeah, we always knew you'd be doing that from when you were seven. Not at all. But in my own journey of learning how to enjoy my own life more and how to be more fulfilled, I ended up taking 
a class on sensuality and sexuality, which happened to also be a coach training. And at the time I knew nothing about what a coach was. I take professionalism seriously. My MD after my name means something to me. And, you know, I, I didn't know what coaching was, but I went to the labs just to improve my understanding of the curriculum. And I found that I loved it. And it really allowed me to translate my medical skills just seamlessly. And the place where I did this training was actually a kind of edgy place. No one else in the course was married or had children. I mean, maybe they were divorced with older children, but it was for people who in polyamorous relationships, various kinks and BDSM Mm -hmm. and like a part of society that I myself would not normally be in. And I didn't find anyone like me there. And I really think one of my contributions is that I learn from people who really are kind of uncensored, unfiltered, not restricted by ambition, professional standards, and great success in life. And I took the learning that I received there and brought it into my suburban bedroom where my husband and I, he's a he still practices medicine. We met in medical school, you know, I'm a soccer mom and we have a very conventional, typical life for two ambitious, competent, good hearted people and taking these learnings and blending it with what I knew from practicing medicine in my own life and assorted trainings and really transforming my own relationship. I was like, I want to be available for people who love the person they're with and don't know how to make the relationship really fantastic. So I work with couples privately. I also have a group program with a lot of private learning and then a once a week live coaching call. And it's incredible how people can transform actually fairly quickly when there's a source of education that works for them. Well, and all that I'll link to so everybody can find that information if this conversation inspires that. But as you were talking, I'm always writing notes that I want to come back to. But it's interesting because, so I'm, you know, I'm I'm very much, um, uh, uh, I I love to meditate. It's part of my daily practice now for years. And when I am working on manifestation type meditations, one of the things I'm always seeing is, um, that is a priority to me is like seeing, you know, my husband and I sex life and intimacy. And I don't want to like confuse intimacy with sex because I think they're two different things. And I'm sure you're going to maybe speak to that too, because the emotional intimacy I share with him and just like the physical connection from just a kiss versus actually having sex to me are all different things. And I want all of those like to stay. And so when I'm meditating and, and, and looking at the future, those are some, those are pieces that I am being intentional about wanting to see in my life when we're 60 and 70. But I think sometimes that we're so caught up on just the day-to-day grind that this is the first area in our life as as a couple that fail. So maybe you can just speak to um, what you see maybe the most common struggle that would be relevant to the listeners right now is um, and 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 what that step might be, step one to starting to mitigate that. Great. So I have um, two different things I want to say. One is that what stokes passion and contributes to emotional intimacy and fantastic sex in a long-term relationship is completely different than when it comes to dating or one night stand or Mm -hmm. something like that. And in fact, when you're married or living with the person who is your beloved, everything that isn't sex is foreplay. So that's one thing to keep in mind that how you interact the rest of the time is either building towards passion or it's not. And that doesn't mean it needs to feel sexy and erotic all the time. That's not at all the point. But to keep in mind that things are not as compartmentalized 
actually as we like to think they are. That's the first thing. Second thing is that what you described is so common. And in fact, the data is that the average couple in the United States, the average couple with kids, spends less than four minutes per day talking about anything besides kids and logistics. And that really is the inroad to the first thing to change. Because um, in my book and in my work with people, there are six essential qualities to conscious partnership. And the first one, which is really extremely easy to implement, is cultivate curiosity. Because if you think of what it's like when you fall in love, you have so many questions. Who is this person? You like want to devour them and know who are they and to reveal who you are. And as we get to know our partner and things feel safe and comfortable, we tend to have fewer questions. But I really think one of the ways to open up more passion, more emotional intimacy is to ask open-ended questions because while you know your husband so well, there are loads of things that you don't know and we forget that our partners are growing and changing and it's worth asking open-ended questions like, um, what are you excited about today? And what are your daydreams currently? If you could change one thing about our life, what would it be? And a personal favorite that I do not recommend starting with is when is the last time you told a white lie? Because mm. we all tell white lies. And these questions that I've just shared are some examples of open-ended questions, which you don't know the answer unless you actually ask. And I want to make sure to say one more thing, because as women with our partners, we might ask the question, and it is even more important that we receive the answer. And the important thing is that our partner is sharing with us. It's not the time to be critical about the content of the response. It's more important that we make it a positive experience that he actually shared with us. Yeah. I am. Um, there's like a million and one things I want to, I'm trying to like process all the things that I want to talk about. And I'm like, man, I like to keep episodes on a timeline, but there's like 55 things I want to talk about. I mean, diving in a little bit deeper to that too is, I feel sometimes, and I've had these conversations with women in my own coaching too, is they crave this deeper level of intimacy and connection. Um, and two things, they're not prioritizing it just flat out. They're not creating the space for it in their life because they're exhausted uh, because whatever X, Y, Z, and insert other. But I also sometimes think that we have fears underneath well, what if the answer isn't something we in our mind expect? Or what if we want to share that we might want to do this new thing together or try this new thing? And not, that doesn't even mean just in the bedroom, um, but maybe you're afraid that the partner's response isn't going to be what you expect. So what do you say to that? One thing in terms of making it a priority, because I agree, people don't, the key to that lies in what we were talking about earlier about the difference between doing and being. And so when I was making this shift in my own marriage, I started doing hip circles super slowly, but just hip circles while I'd cook and look for ways to just be more connected with myself. And then it's a lot easier to prioritize emotional intimacy with my partner. When I'm more connected with myself, then the prerequisite is met for that to be easy. So that's the first thing. But the second is that starting to ask open-ended questions, it is important to stay in initially in territory which is safe so that you can focus on creating the intimacy. But when you have something to share that you feel vulnerable about or you're not sure how he's going to take it, then I recommend the following. To first say, I have something vulnerable to share with you or complicated or confronting or whatever, but let's just say I have something vulnerable to share with you. Are you available to hear it? You want your partner to opt in and it has to be okay for them to say no. Mm -hmm. But if it's your 
partner, then, you know, hopefully that's a not yet. But in any case, after they opt in, then you say why it is that you're telling, which means you need to think about that ahead of time and get clear why it is you're telling it. And then the third thing is what your desired outcome is, which should be a win-win for both of you. I also suggest starting with something simpler like, I have something vulnerable to tell you, are you available? My husband says yes, and I'll say, I want to tell you because I just keep thinking about it and I'm becoming resentful and I just really want to clear it up. And my desired outcome is that once I clear it up, we can have a lot of fun together this evening because I'm going to be more available for that. And then I might go on to say that I really hate it when I get up in the morning and he's left dishes in the sink from the night before because it has me feel taken for granted and disrespected and like my experience doesn't really matter to him. Mm -hmm. That's a totally different communication than no communication and just doing the dishes and becoming resentful and closing mm -hmm. down. It's also a different communication than saying, would you please do the dishes or any variation on it, but to really get clear, like when I wake up and the dishes are in the sink, I, I feel rejected. I feel unimportant to him. And that's a very vulnerable thing to communicate. But both my own and my client's experiences, when it's set up without blame and truly is a vulnerable com communication, it always leads to more connection of various kinds. Yeah. And that's exactly what comes to my mind is we're talking something so simple as doing the dishes, which is a pain point. Many women listening, I myself hate doing the dishes. <laughs> it's usually a role reversal at our house, but I'm thinking that approach, just the, 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 the thing you said at the beginning really hit me of, you know, everything besides sex is foreplay. And if we just took that mindset shift in our marriages, like how freaking powerful would that be? Because every interaction, uh, I feel like uh, today, I, like I'm taking that today and really just looking at my own presence in our marriage, because that's extremely powerful. And Diving deeper into the sex part though, because I do hear from a lot of women that they crave presence and they crave the being part rather than the doing. And I'm putting myself actually just sharing a transparent story. I remember a couple of years ago, my husband and I were in the middle of having sex and he kind of looked into my eyes and he just said to me, you're here, but you're not here. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. He is so right. And, and I was like trying to fight him on it. Like we're like situation, like the scenario stops, comes to like a er, screeching halt. And he sees it in my eyes. Like the old, like my Rolodex of to-do list was happening. And I don't, I, I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. I want to be so present in those moments because it's so deep. Like there's such good, deep connection for both of us in those moments. But it wasn't him that needed to do the work. It was me. And I needed to have the communication to him. So we pulled back literally <laughs> figuratively. <laughs> and, and I was like, here's why I'm struggling. I need more support right, you, right now because I see what you need. You need the physical connection and I do too. But right now I'm managing all of these things and I need, you know, and it went on to be this engaging conversation. And so then we had the discussion about all these surrounding pieces that weren't being met that all of a sudden just amplified our sex because we were able to connect. He knew what I needed. I knew what he needed. And from that day forward, I felt like I've made a conscious effort to really go into sex with him, ch taking a temperature gauge on like, am I being with him? Am I present or am I just going through the motion? So curious what your feedback. I is adore that. that story. It encapsulates so much truth. And in fact, if my husband and I have gone some time without having sex and it's not that I'm staying up super late writing my book or, you know, some like obvious thing to attribute it to. I will ask myself, is there something I'm withholding? Something that needs to be said? Or if I'm clear that that's not true for me, I'll say, is there anything that you're feeling resentful about or, you know, is there anything you're withholding? And at first, honestly, it took courage because, you know, I'm like, 
is he having an affair or, you know, am I not attractive or like, it's an, it's a very courageous thing to ask these questions. And, um, I also knew he wasn't having an affair. Like it wasn't the, the concern was all in my head and my own material to work through. But again and again, if there's some kind of disconnection, usually, again, in the context of long-term partnership, this wouldn't be true on the third date, that it's so important to look at what is the thing I'm not saying. And what a beautiful marriage you have, Amanda, that your husband made a point of saying that and can be there and hold that standard for the quality of how the two of you connect. It's so beautiful. And I actually think if we give permission, this is not a spoken permission, it's a way of being that is permission, most men will prioritize that kind of connection too if we have room for them to look at us in the middle of sex and say, you're not here. Like, I think that is one of the most beautiful expressions of love because in doing that he's being kind and courageous and you're willing to receive the feedback and the result is so much more connection yeah i think that that's one thing that we can all come to terms with is we we want presence from each other in marriage presence to be heard when you have shitty days <laughs> presence to be heard when there's struggles um, in your mind presence to be heard when you need more from one another. And um, I think that shift away from doing to being like just set this whole conversation up so perfectly. So as we come to a close maybe you could give, I always like to give like tangible take homes and you already gave a couple important pieces, but I always want women to walk away from our conversation together and just feeling like they can take action. And for me, the action I'm, I'm leaving with is like everything is foreplay except for sex. So I'm really excited to, to make that shift. But, do but you I want to add one thing to that because um, I can see how that's exciting for you. And for me, it's also super exciting. And there have been times in my life and I'm sure that there are people listening where hearing that could feel like pressure. And mm -hmm. I just really want to clarify that doesn't mean that you need to be sexy all the time or think sexy or anything like that. It just means that however you are interacting, your tone of voice and what you're talking about is either moving closer together or farther apart. It can be taken as something that simple. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you clarifying that too, because, and I think that is my, my take home to it is how am I acting in the marriage to bring us closer together and being intentional about the little things that I probably am moving through my day so fast, not acknowledging that are profoundly impactful to this. You know, it's like compound interest in my opinion. I am, I'm here for the long game when it comes to marriage. And I think most women <laughs> listening are, or have experiences now where they feel like that's what they're craving. And so just like in weight loss or transitioning our understanding with our bodies and, and health in general is so often we're short, we're focusing on short-term intensity and trying to move away in general from that in our lives, so looking at the long game and how can these daily practices and behaviors stack up to making sure that we have passion and we have fulfillment and what it looks like now is the same as what it looks like when we've been together for 40 years, even 20 years. I've been with my husband for 20 years. And so I want it, as you say, to continue to be ju juicy and nourishing and satisfying on, on multiple levels. So I feel like that's actually a, a great way to bring it back that you clarified that. So any last minute that you feel like important take home that you want to share with the girls listening? Yeah. Um, my book, which I've written, is called Uncompromising Intimacy, and I want to explain the title because I think that is another way to um, tie in a nice bow everything we've talked Perfect. about, and that is that the most common relationship advice that is given, at least in Western societies, is that you need to learn to compromise. The key to a good marriage is compromise, and compromise is what it's all about, and I don't believe that at all. I think the key to 
long-term passionate partnership, emotional intimacy, amazing sex, and just fulfilling relationship is to continue to refine your ability to bring all of who you are to the relationship. And that means being accepting of yourself and accepting of your partner to do the same. And I think really the umbrella for everything we've talked about is that the path forward is learning how to bring all of who you are in an uncompromising way. And when you do that, that creates sparks. How oh, well said. Way to put a beautiful little bow on it for sure. Um, so I, I do love to also just touch on a few fun things, especially doing what you are doing as, you know, there's ambigu- ambiguity in the, the name of the, the, the podcast and of course my program in general for a purpose. So I am curious what makes you feel amazing naked in whatever content like resonates with you. Yeah, I have a lot of different answers, but one that I was exposed to, I think I was a teenager on the beach in Europe, in Italy, and I watched this amazing thing happen. There were multiple young, fit, just super pretty, amazing young women, let's say in their early 20s, who were playing volleyball on the beach. And there were a number of men watching, both younger men and older men, various physiques, and they were all watching these women play volleyball. And then this woman who probably was actually in her early 50s with plenty of flesh and boobs hanging a little bit, like she just was not at all like these women playing volleyball, but she was so juicy and totally enjoyed herself and clearly was feeling the sand and the sun and had more attention on her own sensual appearance and very little on what it looked like to anyone else. And I watched every one of those men turn their head and watch her walking until she was no longer visible. And I felt like it was a window into what really matters when you're naked. And so if I'm not feeling amazing naked, I'm looking for more deliciousness within me and then I am right away. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love the idea of no happiness lies ahead that already isn't inside. You just have to find the tools to recognize that it's there. Exactly. Um, Okay. And I love talking about food. So what's your favorite food pleasure? You know, it varies. Right now, I am just in love with homemade chicken broth. Mm. I just, I love the smell. I love the temperature. I love how it feels going down my throat. I just really love it. Fantastic. And the nice, cool weather. Perfect, perfect addition. So Exactly, yeah. Well, I am so excited that this is going to be, um, I, I just feel confident that this episode is going to speak to a lot of women. We're talking about things that women want more of, but often are afraid to engage in conversations because as you said, they're not ready or willing or a little bit fearful of stepping fully into who they are. So if the listeners want, um, more of you, you have a book coming out, um, or by the time this episode, um, airs, it will be available. So I'm going to put the link in, but tell us, um, your website, if you don't mind spelling it out as well and, uh, where listeners can find you. Sure. Uh, my website is alexandrastockwell.com, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A. S-T-O-C-K-W-E-L-L.com. And I'm easily found on Facebook and LinkedIn. My Instagram is The Relationship Catalyst. And if you're listening and something spoke to you, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to dialogue further. Yeah, for sure. And I do love your IG account. Everything will be linked here, but um, just some of your little tidbits are really inspiring to me because uh, maintaining what I feel like I've been able to maintain so far in my marriage. I don't like, I don't want that to slip away. And so, um, so much of what you said today resonated with me. So I really just appreciate you being here and sharing your zone of genius. And I am so excited for the listeners to hear as well. Thank you, Amanda. Really a pleasure.
Absolutely. All right, ladies, go rock your day.